Hello, Chris. Hi, Dominique. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us here at the Cambridge Partnership for Education today to discuss uh, the topic of the book you wrote and uh, was published by Cambridge University Press last September. And the title of the book is Teaching in Challenging Circumstances. So unfortunately, this is a very, very topical issue, uh, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, we see that uh, uh, all over the place, all over the world, uh, all of the teachers are, are, are being affected. So we, we decided uh, to have a kind of a mini series with you uh, where we will have two conversations. The first conversation, we will focus more on, on generally what what do you mean by challenging circumstances? What are the most common challenges and how can those uh, be addressed? Uh, how can we help teachers uh, to address these? And then for the second uh, conversation, uh, we will focus more particularly uh, on what is happening as a result of the war in Ukraine and all the, the uh, unfortunately, all of the young mm. people that are being displaced. Uh, so before we start uh, our conversation, Chris, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your background and how you have become an expert and how you've developed this interest in this very complicated issue? So my background's in English language teaching. So to start with, I, was, uh, I taught English as a, as a foreign language. In my early career, I taught a lot in Nepal where my sort of interest in, in working in those challenging circumstances really uh, started to develop. Uh, but I've also taught uh, ESOL and English for academic purposes and so on as well. So um, I've got a, a sort of fairly wide range of, of working in English language teaching. Um, but then after that, I moved more into uh, training, uh, teacher education, developing uh, materials. Um, and working in places such as Nigeria, Palestine, mm. Lebanon, Somaliland and, and elsewhere. So, uh, but it was that, that first work that I did in Nepal um, sort of about 25 years ago that really sort of started my interest and um, sort of getting a, working in this particular field. I see. So a real, a real personal experience yeah. that, that you were able to bring to this topic. So before we look at uh, the challenges themselves, can you describe what you mean by challenging circumstances? Because I assume that are, there is a whole spectrum, if you want, uh, in, in terms of different contexts. So can you explain a little bit more what you mean by, by, by those circumstances? Yes. Yeah, so what I would say is the name of the book, Teaching in Challenging Circumstances, um, it's, a, it's a deliberate choice of words. So it's... Um, the book itself was influenced uh, by a book um, which was about, about teaching in, in difficult circumstances, teaching English in difficult circumstances. Um, but the word difficult can be seen as quite problematic. It sort of uh, it suggests that something can't be changed. Uh, there's a problem, there's an othering there, that it's something that it's, it's the fault of the people in that particular situation. Um, and it's also very difficult. What does difficult mean? Uh, who is to say what difficult means in any mm. particular situation? So the first of the reason for choosing the word challenging is I think that it suggests that something can be done in those mm. situations. Um, so I think challenging circumstances are defined by the people themselves, by teachers themselves. It's not for me or anyone else to say what is challenging, but I think there are some general themes which we can which we can see which make things uh, particularly difficult and I think it's often there's a it's when there's a mismatch between what a teacher is trying to do at the classroom level and what the Ministry of Education in a particular country uh, wants them to do so that might be over something like the language which can be used in the classroom or over the type of assessment which is used or the teaching approach which they want to uh, want to use in that particular situation so it's when there's a mismatch between what a teacher feels and wants to do in order to support their children in the best possible way and what a Ministry of Education might be trying to impose on that particular person but I think it is it is it is a difficult thing to know what we mean by that. If we take an example like something like large classes, for example, which people often say is an example of a, of a challenging circumstance. But what do we mean by the phrase large class? You know, for some teachers, a class of one is challenging. For, for others, a class of 200 is, is not challenging. It's how you approach that particular situation. Now, obviously, you need to respond differently in those situations. 
you know, if you are teaching a class of 200, for example, you need to think, well, you know, uh, I need to get them to work together. They need to be more supportive of each other. We need a more project-based approach to learning. But things are possible to do in that situation. But it is just rethinking the pedagogical approach which we take in those particular uh, circumstances. Mm. And so what are the most common challenges that uh, you would, uh, that teachers would mention, if you want, in those different contexts that you mentioned? I think often in terms of, uh, for example, in, the, in terms of the pedagogical approach which is expected. So, you know, many teachers might be trying to use, for example, more learner-centred approaches in their classrooms, but their Ministry of Education says, no, you must teach in this particular way, a more top-down, teacher-centric model. Uh, and if there are school inspectors which mark according to those criteria, if things like promotion and everything like that are tied to that inspection, that it means teachers can't really teach in the way that they think is most effective for the students in front of them. So I think certainly pedagogical approach is one area, uh, one problematic area. Uh, another is in language, the classroom language which they can use, the medium of instruction. So again, it may be that at the, at the national level or at the regional level, there is a particular language which has to be used as the medium of instruction. But the teacher themselves may not speak that language or might speak it as an additional language. The students in uh, his or her class may speak different languages as well. But there's still an expectation that that national language or that regional language is used within the classroom. And that's very, very problematic for, for, for many for, for learning to be as effective as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think those are certainly a couple of the sort of main problem areas mm -hmm. which many teachers are facing. Can I pick up then on those two in particular and start from the first one you mentioned, that mismatch between the pedagogical approaches that the ministry and the policy is, is uh, promoting mm -hmm. and, uh, and what the teachers uh, want to do in the classroom. So, what is your advice? How, how can you address that at, at uh, teacher level in the classroom? Yeah, I mean, I think one key thing, whenever I do teacher education, one key thing I think I try and work with teachers on, on how to develop student agency in that situation. I think too many education systems all around the world, and I don't think this is a, a global south thing in particular, I think it's global north, global south, it's everywhere, is that students often don't have agency or they're not given agency to learn in the way that they think is most effective. And so you try and work with teachers to think, well, how can you, how can you give students that agency? How can you make, give them more responsibility? How can you listen to them? How can you get them to work together more effectively? You know, the ideal teacher is one who can, who can sit back, who can set something up and then let the students take that on themselves. So I think that's something I try and work with teachers on, and certainly from a, you know, in, the, in the world of language teaching, that's incredibly important. You know, language shouldn't be something that is only taught from a textbook. Here's a list of vocabulary, here are grammatical items, all the rest of it. It's about how they use that language. It's about the communicative competence that they're able to develop. But there is a problem to that as well in that you encourage teachers to work in this kind of way but then that jars with the expectations mm. that their minist ministries of education are, are saying. And I've seen it before. One of the saddest experiences I had, I think, was in Nepal when I was, uh, this was after my kind of first trip there, doing tr training there with teachers. And um, there was a, a young female teacher who came to the sessions I was on. She was very enthusiastic about all of these kind of ideas. And then I, I, I went to see her teach uh, a few weeks later. And she was doing it, you know, sort of very teacher-centred, the students were silent, all those sorts of things. And we talked about it afterwards, and she just said, my head teacher doesn't want me to teach in that way. And you could see that she was so upset by that. And, and I think that's where the kind of the views of a ministry of education clash with what teachers are trying to do. And that can become so frustrating for a teacher who wants to try these these different things and just doesn't have the opportunity to do that. Mm. So what was your response and your advice to these <laughs> teachers, this poor teacher? In yeah, it was difficult. I, I mean, so my advice there was, I think there are, 
sort of micro resistances that as a teacher you can do in those situations. There are ways in which you can, you can get around that. I think it's also about encouraging the teachers to speak to head teachers, to speak to parents, to explain these kind of things, why those changes are being made. Because it's very understandable why sometimes in, um, in challenging circumstances, the, the unit of the school is the only representation of government in a particular area. And so there's all the sort of local politics and sort of bound up within that institution. Also, we're still seeing that, you know, there are still many, many parents around the world who themselves have not experienced much formal schooling either. Mm -hmm. So they have a particular view of what uh, learning should be. So I think it's trying to not, when we do teacher training, I think it's, it's not enough to just work with teachers. It's important to work with all educational stakeholders as well, to bring everyone along on that journey. Because if we just isolate uh, different groups, then you're not going to get that, that system change. But I think that also presents problems, say, from a funding perspective, certainly in the work I was doing in Nepal. You know, it was relatively easy to raise money to build a new school classroom and mm. to get someone put a brass plaque up and say this was paid for by blah, 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 whatever it may be. But if you go to people and say, will you fund the training of school governors? there's much less interest. Mm. But you could argue that training school governors is the most effective use of that particular amount of resource that you've got. But it doesn't play into that sort of funding narrative. So mm. I think, you know, but we need to look at those systems at the whole system level, not just at particular parts of it. Yeah, system coherence exactly. is, is behind the approach that, that, yeah. that we have. It's quite interesting. So basically your response was to develop teacher agency because they can then, you know, talk to parents, talk to their head teachers. So that's, exactly, that's they could be sort of advocates for these, for mm. these things, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so engage uh, and actively engaged. Um, so picking, going back to what you said earlier, you talked about the, the mismatch on, in pedagogical approaches, but you also mentioned the, the, the issue of language. And, and I think I have been as a teacher in this situation when, when you have to teach a class and some of the kids in the class, uh, it's not their first language. and. Uh, yeah and they're very, you know, it, they're struggling. So what, what is your advice on how to manage uh, for a teacher if having to manage a class uh, in, in those circumstances? Yeah, um, so I think, um, so again, looking at it from a language teacher perspective, one of the things, one of the, I think, myths of language teaching, uh, and it's a very strong kind of myth, but it's, you know, it's that it can only be taught in the target language. You know, if we, when we learn English, you've got to be, it's got to be taught in English. Um, and I think that's problematic for, for, for many, many reasons, but especially in situations where, you know, some children might be learning English there as their third or fourth language in that, in that situation. I think we need to take a step back and to see, for, from, a, from a language learning perspective, English as one of many languages that the students in that particular group may know. Look at the whole sort of linguistic repertoire of the students in that particular situation and allow things like code switching, moving between languages or translanguaging, so allowing students to use those languages which they know in order to acquire uh, the English that they, might be, that they might be learning. And it might be allowing more scaffolding, for example, in, 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 in language tasks. So what I often suggest is, you know, if you ask us, teachers often complain, they say, well, I asked my students to do this particular task and they're silent or they do it in five seconds and they're finished. Why is that? Well, I say, well, you're asking them to do something which is conceptually difficult and linguistically difficult at the same time. So it's kind of no wonder that they don't say anything. So you try and break that down a little bit. You say, well, okay, do this task first in a language of your choice. You know, so they can do it in their own language or in a shared language with another student. So they can get their ideas sorted. They know what they want to say in a language which is more familiar to them. Say, so, okay, now you've done that. Now do it in the target language. Now do it in English. And it becomes much, much easier for them to do that now because they've already thought through their ideas, or you ask them, first of all, do it in part English and part in your first language. You know, you can, it's like a sliding scale. So I think we need to be, to look at how we can use the languages which students already know 
as a bridge, as a link to acquiring uh, other languages. Mm. Being aware of that as, as you're preparing your lesson is, is quite important, I think. Uh, absolutely, uh, as well. yeah. Yes, and, yes. and seeing other languages, sometimes in language teaching, other languages are seen as a problem, but we should see them as an opportunity. You know, they can, you know, because languages are similar, they are different to the target language, but all of that knowledge can help students put these things together. You know, and in, in situations where people may not have many resources, learning resources and teaching resources, the one resource which all students have is a language. And so let's use that rather than see it as a, as a hindrance. Mm, thank you. That's, yeah. that's really uh, useful advice. The, the, the last question I wanted to ask you in your book, and you, you haven't mentioned that, but you do mention that in, in your book, is bullying. Mm. Uh, very often you have that, that can happen in, in challenging circumstances where you have uh, children that are displaced. They might be from minorities and they might be picked up uh, because of that. Mm. So what, uh, what advice would you have for teachers uh, you know, facing this kind of challenge? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult uh, to do that. But I mean, I, I think what I try and work with teachers on, for example, is, is how, again, it's looking at the things which are in your control. When you're teaching in those sorts of situations, often you can feel everything is out of control. Um, and you know, there's so many external factors that can affect what you're doing. So it's really looking to what you can control in that situation, because that gives you agency as a teacher as well because you know this is something that you can control and generally speaking not always but generally speaking teachers have control over what happens in their own classrooms and you can make your classroom uh, a safe space for those students uh, and I hear it time and time again in where I've worked in Nigeria or Palestine or wherever it may be is that students often feel that the classroom, the school, is the safest place in their world. You know, because so much of the rest of their life is difficult, is chaotic, you know, issues with their parents, family, all sorts of, all sorts of things. But the classroom is something that is reasonably stable. And as a teacher, what you can try and do is create almost a model within that particular environment. You can normalize being kind to each other you can normalize working together on particular projects you have to be careful as well you don't you know for example if you're putting students into groups you want to be careful about about how you do that you want to think about that and certainly to start with you might not want to put students together if they come from very different groups or different language backgrounds or, or whatever it may be that may be something that comes further down the line um, you can do things like whole class activities where students accidentally meet each other. They spend a few seconds talking to one person and then moving on to another. So again, it's normalising all those sorts of relations uh, within the classroom. There's things like you can create safe spaces within the classroom where if students are feeling bullied or threatened, they can go there and regulate themselves uh, till they are ready to learn again or they can uh, respond positively to that. So I think it's, it's looking at all the things that you as a teacher can do in that situation to normalise those relationships. Bullying may st still happen. You need to obviously keep an eye out for that. You need to encourage students to tell you if those sorts of things are happening. But I would say it's looking at what you can do to control that situation to, to minimise the risk of those things happening. Mm. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for all of this uh, advice, Chris. And I think going back to what you said at the beginning, uh, by choosing challenging over difficult, you know, you wanted to make it feel positive. So although we didn't have a great amount of time, I think what you have demonstrated here just now is that there are techniques, there is a way of, of dealing with those uh, circumstances, even though it's not easy. Uh, there are ways of, of minimizing all of this. So, Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Thank you, Dominique.